Hey guys, oh, welcome to Marcel Community Church Online. If we haven't met yet, my name's Hans. I'm the lead pastor of, of this church. It is great to have you with us online. And today we are starting a very small, uh, short series, a three-week series. Um, we've got Al Stewart, who is the National Director of the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches. He's going to be preaching uh, over the next three weeks through the book of Daniel. And uh, he's entitled this sermon series, Unshakable. And it's all about having faith in a faithless world or unshakable faith in a faithless world. We want to have a faith in Jesus that withstands the trials that this world throws at, at us. And so that is what we're going to be learning over these next three weeks. But with him, that in mind, I, I want to tell you just a little bit about Marsville Community Church. If you're new here, what you've got to realize about us is this, that we're all on about the Lord Jesus because of all that he has done for us in dying for us, in rising again from the dead for us, in giving us a hope and a future. And so with that in mind, everything that we do today is for his glory. And so what we're going to do right now is we're going to sing our first song, One My Heart. Uh, we're going to sing a praise to, to the Lord Jesus because he is so special to us because of all that he has done. And then kids, what you've got to do is shuffle forward to the, to the computer screen or the TV screen because we're going to have um, the kids spot from QuizWorks.
Oh, hey, Reg. Oh, hi, Miriam. Yeah, hi, everyone. I'm Miriam, and that's Reg. Yeah, hi. And welcome back to QuizWorks Home Delivery. As you know, Ooh. we're working our way through the awesome book of Acts. Ooh, yeah. And in Acts, we're seeing that, oh, do it with me, the mission of the risen King Jesus cannot be stopped. <laughs> well, today, as we get to Acts chapter 15, we're going to see that the message of this mission is clear. It's only by yeah. repenting and accepting Jesus as their king that people are made right with God. Hey, hey, Miriam, can you please pass me that marker? Oh, yeah, this one? Yeah, sure. One. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Reg? Yeah? What are you doing? I'm making the Real Puppet Society. Why are you starting the Real Puppet Society? Oh, because Bubbles and I, we were having an argument about oh. which one of us is a real puppet. What makes a real puppet? Duh, a real puppet has brown hair. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a real puppet eats baked beans on ice cream. Okay. Yeah, and a real puppet, they say woof, woof, oh. woof, woof, um, woof. Uh, I'm right. And because Bubbles is blue and doesn't eat ice cream with baked beans and because she doesn't bark... She's not a real puppet. Reg, I'm not sure that all real puppets are brown, um, eat baked beans on ice cream and say woof. Yes, they do. Uh, look, look, you've got a picture of the Muppets back there. Yeah, I love yeah. the Muppets. Uh, who's your favourite Muppet? Oh, Kermit the Frog, of course. <laughs> okay, and is Kermit the Frog brown? No, he's green. Uh-huh. Yeah, oh, oh <laughs> so I guess... Real puppets aren't always brown. And look, you've got this really cool picture of Scruff and you. Yeah, Scruff yeah. and I are besties. Does Scruff eat baked beans on ice cream? No, he eats chalk-coated bones. Everyone knows that. Uh-huh. Oh, not all puppets eat baked beans on ice cream. No, no, no. no. Uh, <laughs> and look, there's a yep. photo of all of your QuizWorks puppet friends. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Apart from uh, you and Scruff, yeah. do any of them say woof? Oh, I guess no, they don't. Oh, I guess no. not all real puppets say woof. No. Oh. Nope. Oh, dear. What makes a real puppet then? I've got to go find out. Oh. <laughs> Oh, um, okay. Today, when we get to Acts chapter 15, we meet some people who are claiming that to be a real Christian, you have to be a certain type of person. But as we look at Acts 15, we will see that it's just by repenting and accepting Jesus as their king that people are made right with God. Let's watch our story. Paul had just returned from his first missionary journey. Paul told the church in Antioch what God had done. We have told lots of people about the risen King Jesus, and many people repented and accepted Jesus as their King. Hooray! The church in Antioch explained. They were so excited. But then some other people came to the church in Antioch, and they told the people a different message. To be a real Christian, to really be made right with God, you need to repent and accept Jesus as your king and become a Jew. Paul did not like this message. No, you don't. All you have to do is repent and accept Jesus as your king. The church in Antioch was confused. This was such an important question. Were people made right with God just by repenting and accepting Jesus as their king? Or were people made right with God by repenting and accepting Jesus as their king and doing something else? We don't know what to do! The church said. Go! Go to Jerusalem and find the other apostles and find out what we should do. And so... Paul and some others left Antioch and headed to Jerusalem to see the other leaders of the church. When they arrived, they called the church leaders and the apostles together and they discussed the question, are people made right with God just by repenting and accepting Jesus as their king or do they need to do something else as well? To help work out the answer, Peter spoke first. Remember Cornelius? God gave him the Holy Spirit when he heard the message of the risen King Jesus. 
He was made right with God just by repenting and accepting Jesus as his king. Then Paul spoke. My friends and I have been traveling to many different places and many people have trusted the risen King Jesus. They were made right with God just by repenting and accepting Jesus as their king. Finally, Jesus' brother James spoke up. God's scriptures have told us that God will save people who are not Jews. And the Holy Spirit has shown that people who are not Jews can be made right with God just by repenting and accepting Jesus as their king. All the apostles and church leaders agreed. People don't need to do anything else. Everyone can be made right with God just by repenting and accepting Jesus as their king. When the church back in Antioch heard this news, they were overjoyed. Hooray! And so the mission of the risen King Jesus could spread. Everywhere Christians could clearly proclaim, everyone can be made right with God just by repenting and accepting Jesus as their King. The End Okay, Miriam, I found the answer. I Googled it. <laughs> Wikipedia says, and I quote, a puppet is an object that is animated or manipulated by a person called a puppeteer. Mm -hmm. yep, I have okay. no idea what that means. <laughs> it means a real puppet is um, uh, someone is lending them a hand. Oh, lending them a hand? Mm -hmm. So does someone lend Bubbles a hand too? Yeah, someone does. So she is a real puppet. Maybe she'll want to join my real puppet society then. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, right. Well, I'm off to find her. See ya. Okay, Bye. see ya. <laughs> Today, we have seen that what really makes someone a Christian is not what they look like. It's not what they wear. It's not what country or background they're from. Because the Bible clearly tells us that everyone can be made right with God just by repenting and accepting Jesus as their king. And so kids, you need to make sure you are repenting and accepting Jesus as your king. And we also need to make sure we are telling our friends about the risen King Jesus. And as we do, we can know that, do it with me, the mission of the risen King Jesus cannot be stopped. See you next time. Hey guys, well, well, isn't it great to sing together? Isn't it great to, to be encouraged just by those kids' talks? I love them. I'm an adult, but I still love them. It's great. Right now we're going to have our first Bible reading from Serena and then Joss is going to lead us in prayer. Morning. Our first reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8. We're reading the verses 34 to 38. So Mark 8 from verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Good morning, church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the God that hears our prayers, you have said that you'll be present whenever two or three gather in your name. We welcome your presence and grace in our lives today. We ask that you make your glory obvious to us today and shine your light on us. Through your light, may we illuminate the lives of those around us. As we feel your presence and worship today, may our, may our knowledge of your divine works continue to grow and change our lives forever. Lord, we pray today for guidance for our world leaders and governments as they are seeking to manage situations that are difficult. Give them wisdom, discernment and cool heads, Lord. Give people wisdom and discernment too in how they seek to vote for their leaders, being ever mindful, Lord, that you're in control and guiding us at international, national, state and local government levels. Help us to hear your voice clearly, Lord, and be guided by your word. Lord, we also think today of the world we live in and the many stresses people are now living with. Lord, you are our provider. 
Everything we have comes from you. But right now, many people feel like everything is being taken from them. Many have been laid off from work and cannot make money. They are worrying about how to pay their bills and how to feed their family. For heads of the family, who are usually the strong ones, even they are feeling anxiety right now. Please be with us, Lord. Please help us to point our family to you, even though they may feel lost and confused. Help us to demonstrate trust in you to our family. Give us the discipline to lead our family in worship, since we cannot gather with our whole church family. Give us peace. Help us use this time to learn new things about each other, about ourselves and about you. We trust you. Help us to demonstrate that trust to our family so that they may feel safe during this crazy time. Help us all, Lord, to be compliant right now with the government guidelines to maintain not only our own health, but the health of others in the community, particularly the vulnerable. This too is a season, as the writer of Ecclesiastes reminds us, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. Lord, we're also ever mindful of Hans, church leaders and their families. Help us as a congregation to be sensitive to their needs and the stresses they too are feeling at this time. Give them wisdom, Lord, and a dependency on your word for guidance in their decisions in relation to MCC. Even though we are a part of this time, keep us unified in our aim to serve you and see many come to you. Lord, and to seek to change as many people's eternities as possible. In the words of the beautiful song, The Blessing, Lord, may your presence go before us and behind us and beside us. Amen. Hey guys, even though the lockdown is still happening, there's always a bunch of things on at Marsfield Community Church. The first thing is something I want you to do. If you could click the link that's down in the chat box and I want you to fill out your communication card. It, is, it will be great to see, uh, to find out who is listening to us and who is with us today, especially if you're new. Could you fill that out? And you can let us know if there's anything that we can do to help you at this time. Um, just one announcement today, and that is Flourish. Flourish is a ladies' event that we, we hold quarterly here at Marsfield Community Church. And, and it, it's a time when the ladies can get together and have great fellowship and encourage each other in their journey with Jesus. Uh, and there's usually a great speaker, and, uh, and there, there will be, again, another great speaker. It is on uh, the next Flourish is Saturday, the 1st of August at 2 p.m., but instead of meeting together as a group of ladies at the church, uh, you, the ladies will be meeting in uh, small groups, much like we do for church. We, we've got a great speaker, Kylie Wilson, who's continuing to look at the parables of Jesus, and, and she'll be encouraging the ladies about how God is growing his kingdom. And so here's what I want you to do. Uh, please RSVP via the email link you will receive today via email. Click the link, RSVP straight away, and, uh, and we will group, the, the organising team will group you in, in uh, we'll put you in groups in your area so you can fellowship with, uh, with ladies there. And the cost is $47.50. No, it's not. For this time only, it's $5.00. Actually, it's $5 all the time. You just have to pay $5. And that just covers the cost of the speaker. Um, and so make sure you, you get that in. If you can't afford that $5, just put that down in the email. We don't want to let that get in your way of coming to this great event. But right now, what we're going to do right now is have our second Bible reading. And then we're going to listen to the first talk from Daniel uh, that Al Stewart is going to bring. Our second reading comes from Daniel. We're reading the whole of chapter 1. So that's Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia, and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. 
The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Bel-Etashazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for, permis for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favour and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Well, I think you can safely say our world is in chaos at the moment uh, with the virus in terms of health and sickness and people dying, um, economies all around the world. Who knows what is going to happen apart from a world of pain that's coming. Uh, I read the other day the geopolitical arm wrestling between the USA and China and other nations and it's chaotic. And even in Australia, uh, in our lifetime, uh, we haven't seen things like this happen. Uh, who is in control of our world? It can very easily feel like, I understand, that it feels like no one is in control. And yet, what we believe about God and is he in control of our world will have a huge effect on the way we look to the future and uh, our levels of anxiety or confidence. Now, the book of Daniel is written about two and a half thousand years ago, but it's actually written to show us who is in control of our world. It's written in, I guess you could say, more than chaotic times for people who had a trust in the God of the Bible. And yet, what the book of Daniel shows is four young men, Daniel and his three friends, who are able to live in times of chaos with confidence uh, and certainty and wisdom because of what they believe about God. Uh, let me give you some quick breakdown. We're going to look at the book of Daniel or just three chapters. Uh, chapter one is about, um, how can we put it, about seduction, about the call to give in and just fit in with what the world out there wants. Uh, we're going to look at chapter two about what is God doing in the world and if you like the the long game that God is playing. And we'll look at chapter four, some hard lessons in humility. So let's get rolling uh, and see what Daniel teaches us about uh, who's in charge of our world. Chapter one is about uh, the pressure to fit in, in the sense of seduction, to just uh, do you go with the flow. And in this way, uh, people who have their trust in Jesus can be like uh, the drunk guy on the donkey, you know, fall off one side or fall off the other. One, one way that some, some Christian people react is to kind of circle the wagons, uh, stay away from the non-Christian world, have nothing to do with it, isolate yourself, uh, feel really defensive. 
the other wrong way to fall off the donkey is to just fit in and be no different uh, to the non-Christian world. To just accept the ethics, to just say things like same-sex marriage or euthanasia or abortion or whatever, well, it's all okay, and sort of, like my Staffordshire Terrier does, roll over and want a belly rub from the non-Christian world. So one way to fall off, completely withdraw. The other way is kind of to just fit in. But there's another way, and you see that in Daniel chapter 1. So let's have a look. Uh, Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The armies of Babylon invaded Judah uh, in 605 BC and then a number of other times they came back and destroyed the city. Uh, The first time they did, we're told, chapter 1, verse 2, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles of the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Uh, You see three successive invasions, 605, 597 and 587 B.C., and what Nebuchadnezzar did was not to, dis- not to uh, kill all the people, but, but he took the cream of the crop, the best, the most educated, the most capable, and took them from Jerusalem back to Babylon. He really wanted to take the skill and the ability out of the country and use it for his empire. Of course, uh, Daniel and his three friends are caught up in that uh, deportation back to Babylon. Now, there's a theological problem there for the people of Jerusalem, and that is they were God's promised, God's chosen people, and they were living in the promised land, and God had made promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David about them living in the land, and yet the Babylonians have come, conquered them, and dragged them out of the land. How do you explain that? We'll come back to that later. So the Babylonian Empire was huge. Here's a map. You see it kind of stretched across the the known world. How do you rule a giant empire like that? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar could be a ruthless tyrant, but he's also a very clever man. Now, he didn't have emails or uh, mobile phones or voicemail or, or Zoom meetings. So he was able to actually get some stuff done rather than be interrupted all the time. But what do you do? Well, you get the very best and the cleverest of your people uh, from around the empire and you bring them together and get them to fall in love with Babylonian culture, get them to understand how the empire works. And that's exactly what the king decided to do. See chapter 1 verse 3, the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family, the nobility, uh, sorry, and the nobility. Verse 4, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. Verse 5, the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table and they were to be trained for three years and after that they were to enter the king's service. It was an invitation to get this perhaps we could call it scholarship, was the opportunity to be involved in ruling the world, uh, as the Babylonians did. It's an idea that's been copied in the modern world as well. So Cecil Rhodes, who um, an Englishman and uh, the founder of Rhodesia in Africa, began the Rhodes Scholarship. Uh, And uh, you've no doubt heard of Rhodes Scholars. Uh, um, He died in 1902. There's one of my friends, uh, Elizabeth, was a Rhodes Scholar, and I couldn't help but think how Daniel chapter 1, the offer to work for the king and a scholarship, the Rhodes Scholarship was similar. So I wrote to her and said, what do you think about Daniel chapter 1? Here's what she said is when she wrote back. She said, the Rhodes Trust was set up after Cecil Rhodes died in 1902. The website says, Mr Rhodes dreamed of improving the world through the diffusion of leaders motivated to serve their contemporaries. Actually, she says, it was more sinister. The Rhodes Scholars were explicitly intended to promote the interests of the British Empire around the world. We were all supposed to come to Oxford, be captivated by the glories of England and go forth as missionaries around the world to lead the colonies and make sure that they they acted in the interests of the empire. 
And she goes on to say, or just to show how once you're a Rhodes Scholar, doors to success just open. And you see Daniel and his three friends are caught up in this. Uh, they have the world on a platter. And really, uh, Babylon ruled the world. We've got uh, some pictures here of what Babylon would have looked like. They're artists' impressions of what Babylon would have looked like at the time of Daniel. You know, Babylon's a city in modern-day Iraq. Uh, the scholars tell me the city walls were large enough for chariots to pass each other on the walls, and the walls ran for 27 kilometres. There's a magnificent Ishtar Gates, which are now in a German museum. Uh, here's a picture of the hanging gardens of Babylon that Nebuchadnezzar built because one of his wives missed her mountain homeland. A lot of work to uh, make his wife happy. So Daniel and his three friends could have had the world on a platter. And it would have been easy to think that God's cause looked very small compared to the power of Babylon. In verse 6, we're introduced to Daniel and his friends. Verse 6, among these, those chosen for the internship, among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names, to Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach and to Azariah, Abednego. Uh, Daniel's Jewish name uh, means God is my judge. And then Daniel's friends, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, are all derived, names derived from the God of Israel. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego are names that come from uh, the Babylonian gods. And Daniel's given the name Belteshazzar. Now, they, the four young men accept, uh, accept these names. Why? At the same time as the book of Daniel is written, God is speaking to the exiles in Babylon through the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah says this in Jeremiah 29, verse 4, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, in Babylon. Uh, and verse 7, uh, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. In other words, you're going to be there for a long time, as it turned out, a lifetime for these guys. You're going to be there for a long time and so cooperate, be useful, uh, fit in where you can, where you're able. And so they do fit in, they learn uh, the education system of the Babylonians, they learn their culture, their laws, they understand their gods and astrology. Now, they don't worship their gods, but they understand the system. But it is interesting that you see in chapter 1, there's a line that Daniel and his friends will not cross. So they fit in where they can, but they draw the line at, see, verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine... And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Uh, here's a picture, kind of a Sunday school picture, of Daniel and his three young friends saying no to the, the beautiful food and wine from the king's table. You notice the picture, they look like kids. Well, that's pretty accurate. Uh, the book of Daniel shows us that Daniel had a, uh, a career in the king's, multiple kings, in their service, for well over 60 years. And so it's likely, maybe 66 plus years. So it's likely that Daniel was only in his early teens when he did this, when he stood up this way. Now, why does he decide not to eat the food and wine from the king's table? Lots of different theories. Some people have said, well, that's because they couldn't eat pork. It was ritually unclean. I think, yeah, but why is it they couldn't drink the wine? Um, others have said, well, it was because all that food was sacrificed to the gods, uh, the Babylonian gods. But it's also likely that the vegetables that they eat were sacrificed to the gods. And what you see later, if you've got your Bible there, you could have a look later. In chapter 10, verse 3, when Daniel's an old man, he is eating meat and drinking wine. So why does he decide it now? Well, the best explanation I can come up with is this. Daniel and his friends realise there's no free lunches. That is, if you eat with someone, 
<clears throat> you're accepting them and it brings obligation. After all, if you get to the New Testament, one of the great criticisms of Jesus is that he ate with sinners, which means that he, he had a fellowship, that he accepted them. It's the same today. Uh, why is it that in the corporate world, uh, company executives buy each other lunches? Or why is it that uh, they have corporate boxes at the football for, for customers? Do you remember football? It's where guys used to play with a ball on a big field and it'll come back one day. But why? Uh, because hospitality brings obligation. And Daniel understood that. And Daniel and his friends say, they draw the line and say, no, we're... We're not for sale. We will not eat at the king's table in that way, um, even though the king was unaware of it. Very different to uh, the book of two kings in the Bible. Two Kings 25, 27 to 30 tells us Jehoiachin, who had been king of Jerusalem, gets let out of prison and he eats like a lapdog at the table of the king of Babylon every day. So the king of Jerusalem caved in but Daniel and his three young friends stand firm. We're not exactly sure why they drew the line here. I guess the point is there was a line and they drew it. So they decide to give up meat, uh, give up meat for years. And give up meat is a big call. I'm a guy who would very happily have a dessert steak uh, most nights, but it's what Daniel and his friends do. Now, it's a decision and also a dangerous decision. You see verse 9. Now, God had caused the official to show favour and sympathy to Daniel, verse 10, but the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why, should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age, the king would have my head because of you. So that um, he realises to disobey the king in this means people are going to lose their heads. So what does Daniel do? Well, he politely tries... Uh, asks the steward who is a little lower down the food chain. He tries again, just with a different person in the food chain. Verse 11, Daniel then said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, verse 12, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Daniel then said, um, then compare our appearance, verse 11, then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. And so the guard took away their choice food and wine uh, they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. I suspect it was not hard to work out where all the great food and wine ended up. But then uh, between verse 16 and 17 is three years. So uh, Daniel, as, as the narrator tells the story, we jump three years to the end of the internship and we see what happens. Verse 17. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel can understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Comes very significant later. Verse 18, at the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. 19, the king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Uh, Cyrus conquered Babylon in 539 BC. That's around 66 years later. And so Daniel served one king after another for, for well over 60 years. And this chapter uh, sets the scene for the life of Daniel. He's uh, calm and solid and honourable, as I said, for more than six decades. And if you read the book of Daniel, he won't be seduced by the offer of, you know, ruling the world with Nebuchadnezzar and he won't be intimidated. You see that in chapters 3 and chapter 6 by the threat of persecution. Now, why could he do that? Why could he stand firm and confident in the middle of uh, seduction and threat and, a, and chaos in terms of the wider world? Well, it's because he understood who's in charge. 
And it seems like God's absent in this chapter until you really look. And, and let me show you three times very clearly God appears. The power of God is obvious. The first time, uh, God gave, or let me put it this way. There's three times it says God gave, God intervenes. The first time uh, is in chapter 1, verse 2. And the Lord delivered, or gave, the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. God delivered the king of Judah into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. Remember I said there was a theological problem that they were the promised, uh, the, the, the chosen people of God and in the promised land. The, pro the problem is that promise depended on them responding in faith and trust to God. And they didn't. The people of Jerusalem and Judah had walked away from God and ignored him and God had warned them and warned them and warned them quite literally for centuries warned them if they kept walking away, he would throw them out of the land. And finally he did. So the first time, chapter 1, verse 2, God controls the nations and God controls history. The second time that you see God intervene in chapter 1, verse 9. Now, God had caused the official to show favour and sympathy to Daniel. What's it showing? At a much smaller level, God controls the hearts and minds of people. Uh, Daniel knew his fate was not in the hands of this Babylonian bureaucrat. His fate were actually in the hands of God. And so Daniel didn't fear people and their power. And the third, in chapter 1, verse 17, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature. That is, the third, God is the one who gives gifts and abilities. Uh, and so Daniel, for all his brilliance, could remain humble. There you go. Three times. Uh, God is the one who controls the nations. God is the one who controls people. God is the one who gives us gifts and abilities. Confidence and humility at the same time. So let's try and just pull a lesson out of that. How do you live as a follower of Jesus in our world? Uh, uh, Jesus is very clear that to follow him will cost so, for example, in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, he says this, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. The idea is to, to say no to self. Deny themselves. Take up their cross and follow me. You see, often to follow Jesus it will cost, won't it? It might mean saying no to different jobs or job prospects. It, it, for you it may mean saying no to getting romantically involved with someone who doesn't follow Jesus because it would make it so hard to follow him. It might mean being mocked or rejected even in your own family. But understanding the sovereignty of God, that God is king, means that he can look after us and we know that. And so the way that we respond, it doesn't have to be like the drunk guy on the donkey. We don't have to, you know... Um, circle the wagons and have nothing to do with the, the non-Christian world uh, or we don't have to kind of roll over, want a belly rub and just blend in. What do you see Daniel do? He, he cooperates where he can. He takes the internship. He learns the education. He works brilliantly for the king. He cooperates, but he won't compromise. He, he won't give in on certain things that are really important. So to cooperate, but not compromise. And he draws a, a line in the sand, if you like, where there's things he won't do. The New Testament gives us principles for how to act rather than detailed rules. And so different people who follow Jesus will draw that line in different places. The really significant thing here is if you follow Jesus, there needs to be that line or those lines need to be drawn. And it may look different for different people. Um, I'll work really well in my job. I will go the extra mile. I'll be the greatest employee. But I will not sell my soul to the, to the company. I will not breach my own ethical standards. I will have a life outside of work. Or I'll go for drinks on Friday afternoon with everyone and, and socialise, but I will not get drunk and I will leave at the right time. Or... I will love my family, I'll care for my parents, I will be the best son or daughter, you know, on the planet. But if my family are not followers of Jesus, I will not compromise on 
belonging to a church or in other areas. You see, also, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, um, can you see the difference that that makes when you understand that God holds history in his hands, uh, the God who controls the nations, the God who controls people's actions, the God who gives us good things can be trusted. It changes the way that we face the future. You pray with me? Please, God, we ask that we would be able to see clearly that you are the one who controls the nations, even when we can't see what's happening, that you are the one who controls people and their actions, and you are the one who gives us good things in our lives. And we ask, please, we might be able to face the future with trust rather than anxiety. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, guys, wasn't that great to be encouraged uh, about having great faith, strong faith in a, in a world that it doesn't have faith in the Lord Jesus? And so with that in mind, what we're going to do, we're going to respond to God in song and we're going to stand and we're going to sing when I survey. Why don't you stand and sing with us? So guys, thank you so much for for being online with us. Thank you for participating in however you did that. I hope you're encouraged to keep on living for Jesus and uh, or, or maybe hear about Jesus for the first time. And so in response to what we've heard today, I want you to, to go out and live for Jesus. And so I end with these words from Numbers chapter 6. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. We'll see you next week.